Good morning, good afternoon, good day to all of you who are joining us on this particular session today. My name is Professor Chris Alden. I'm director of LSE Ideas. Uh, I'm here and also a professor within the International Relations Department here at uh, LSE. It's a real pleasure to be able to, to uh, greet you today and talk about uh, our program, our MSc in International Strategy uh, and Diplomacy. And uh, it's and I've brought together today a whole cast of, of, of the people that are involved in, in this program. Uh, and they'll be speaking individually to you and, uh, about their their, por their portion of the program. We also have two uh, current students who can speak to the realities, as it were, as at least as they see it. Um, th this program is is a unique program, and we think that uh, that it, that you'll agree with us, uh, uh, if if not already, certainly after through, through this session and afterwards. It's a uh, it involves pulling together the policy dimensions of of the subject right of strategy and and uh, uh, diplomacy and also drawing on the academic foundation we we bring these two together in a way that is is unique uh, you don't see it in in other, any of the other programs out there and i think that that's part of the reason we have such a a, a lively challenging and engaged uh, program throughout the year uh, we do we also have multiple forms of delivery, that is to say, things that are both um, active in person. We also have online activities that bring in major practitioners, significant academics that, that give uh, a real sense that this is a program that has that, that Give, that has knowledge, that gives you foundational information that can help you to do your, your job better, if that's what you're thinking to do with this, to rethink uh, some of the assumptions of, of about the international community, um, uh, the, the, the system in change and transition. And it also is something that can give you uh, a set of skills that you can uh, bring to bear on, on moving to, to other areas that you might want to explore in the future about strategy, about diplomacy, negotiations, and the like. Um, I, th I think that uh, rather than than give you more of the general statements, I'm going to jump right into the specifics. I'm going to ask uh, our direct, our head of and director of the the policy side of our program, uh, Hugh Sandman, to speak a bit on, on this. Over to you, Hugh. Thanks very much, Chris, and I'll add my welcome to everybody. Uh, it's great to have this chance today to talk to you about our program. Um, I'm a practitioner myself. I have a background in international investment banking um, and a number of other fields, including journalism. And my job is to bring in a series of speakers who complement the academic side of the program. Uh, on the practitioner side, we have about 50 to 60 speakers each year. These are a mix of politicians, uh, diplomats, defense officials, uh, former military officers, intelligence operatives, and a number of other functions. And we bring them in over the eight months of teaching uh, from September to April. Now, there are four segments in the practitioner side of the program. And for each of these, all of the students are in the room together. Uh, we start in September with strategy, looking at the practice of strategy by states and by people and organizations. Uh, then in January, we look at the practice of diplomacy and foreign policy, including conflict resolution and diplomatic negotiation. Uh, the third practitioner-led segment takes place in February uh, when we meet off-site uh, off campus for a simulated diplomatic um, negotiation, a diplomatic summit meeting uh, exercise. And this year we were in Cambridge uh, doing a very tough assignment, which was a uh, simulated summit between Russia, Ukraine and the US to try and bring at least the pause to the Ukraine war. The final segment of the um, practitioner part of the program takes place in April. We've just got it coming up now in a couple of weeks uh, when we focus on strategy, diplomacy and decision making in crisis situations. 
Now, every one of our speakers that we bring in is asked to address really specific issues that relate directly to the learning objectives of the segment they're teaching in and the objectives of the whole course. So there's a very strong integration between the practitioner side of the program and the academic side of the program. Uh, my point is that all our speakers are interesting people with a lot to say and fascinating stories to tell. But what we insist is that they focus on teaching our students the specific agenda that we're focusing on. And if I had to put it, summarize it in a couple of words, I say that I'd say that in contrast to the academic side of the program, which is designed to teach you uh, intellectual autonomy and critical thinking, on the practitioner side of the program, we're essentially looking at teaching the field craft of moving around effectively in a fast changing, highly politicized environment. Um, every year we bring in speakers from all over the world. Uh, for example, this year, 2023 to 24, we're hearing from 15 countries, from Australia, Canada, China, Finland, Gambia, and India, to South Africa, Turkey, Uganda, Ukraine, and the UK. And just to mention two of the keynote speakers on our final day in April, who exemplify, I think, the uh, the benefits of this course. Uh, they are two distinguished alumni uh, who took the course about 12 years ago. Uh, they are Ambassador Mitsuko Hayashi from Japan's Foreign and Defense Ministry uh, and uh, Dame Karen Pierce, who is Britain's current ambassador in Washington. They both took the course, as I mentioned, 12 years ago at a formative stage in their working lives. Our practitioner program, like our academic program, is really about interaction. Every talk is split roughly evenly between lecture and discussion. Um, and every session is an opportunity for students to interact with world class expertise. And as the year progresses, there's a sort of cumulative debate going on among all of us, students, faculty, speakers in the room after lectures, during seminars, or in the pub afterwards, as we collectively think through the issues we're addressing. Uh, it's a remarkable conversation about becoming more effective in a changing world, and we very much hope you're going to join it. So at this point, I'll hand over to Aaron to talk about the academic side of the course. Thank you, Hugh. That's great. I think I might have a couple of slides. Do I have some slides? Right. So I'm Aaron McKeel. I'm um, the academic director on this program. Um, my role is to coordinate the academics as well as making sure that the practitioners and the academic side fit together uh, smoothly as the convener. Been on this program for a number of years now. I really enjoy it. I hold a PhD from the LSC, uh, so I'm really happy to be still here. Um, can we go to where we're going to start? So let me show you, because this is um, a, a real MSc degree. I think there's some confusion in the title of this program, the LSE Executive MSc uh, International Strategy and Diplomacy. It, it's more accurately described as an MSc for executives, right? So it's a real academic degree. So it involves uh, the full rigor of academic credentials and academic uh, exercises and assignments. Uh, it's a bespoke program, however, tailored and delivered for uh, busy executives. So this is our little program journey map uh, that we've uh, kind of put to give you a picture of the, the steps you take along the way, right? So right now, you're in pre-program stage, um, looking to apply, applied or having an offer, um, looking to get pre-program readings, getting interested in this world of uh, strategy and diplomacy, uh, in more of an intellectual and serious way. Then when you join us in uh, September, uh, we'll start off with the practitioners and we'll be doing strategy all term. And we'll turn over to the academics. And we have a module on power politics and the changing international order. Uh, our first policy weekend is on, focused on China, the largest and uh, perhaps the most important uh, great power today. 
And then we turn to the global economic order and before we do the week on uh, the global south. And in after the break, we'll do diplomacy one at a time. That's a full program. Uh, where Hugh, of course, brings us the practitioners, uh, the diplomats, and the ambassadors. And then we bring in the academics to, to look at uh, foreign policy and foreign policy analysis. And we look at global challenges such as climate change or nuclear arms control. And um, through that journey, you're moving forward in your intellectual development, gaining all your academic uh, intellectual skills through your assignments. At the end, you'll have your, your dissertation, and that's your summer term, working on your well, own design of um, your own self-crafted dissertation project. Uh, I think the next slide should show us more about that. Right, okay. So we've got these kind of specialized terms for assignments, um, formative and summative. A formative assignment is essentially for practice. Um, it's required to do it, um, and you do get feedback on it, but it doesn't go on your transcript. It helps us clarify expectations. It helps you sharpen up your uh, thinking about this topic uh, before you go attempt the assessment. So the, the summative assessment will go on your transcript. We have one essay, one policy paper, one dissertation plan, and the dissertation itself. Um, the dissertation on this program includes that dissertation plan, which I think is a, a really nice um, addition to the academic requirements on this program. Not every program has one of these, and the quality of the dissertations at the end of the summer, I've always noticed, are actually quite good because of this plan. I always like to um, uh, reap the benefits of it. It's a little bit of work, but you get formal feedback on that plan. Uh, the good thing about this dissertation, as I was saying, is that it's self-designed, so you will have guidance from the faculty on designing your research question, but it's up to you to answer it. And it's up to you to really settle on the question that you're happy with. So you can uh, develop your expertise in a certain specific area, broadly in international affairs uh, of, your, of your choosing. I think it's a terrific uh, opportunity uh, to, to kind of develop your own, not only your analytical abilities, which a dissertation gives you, but certain specialist expertise, which, which a master's degree should give you. Okay, that's the assignment. You may have questions about it. Um, what else can we say? There's another slide, I believe. Okay, right. So this is an interesting slide. Why this program? Um, I think that uh, part of it is that we do have a huge amount of delivery on this program, right? We deliver almost four times the amount of contact and speakers than your normal non-executive uh, MSc. So it is a considerable expense, this program, but there's serious value for money on this. It, it is really one of the most uh, best best programs of its kind that I've seen out there. Um, we've got far more high quality speakers than any program that I've, I've seen out there. This uh, slide here is not exactly uh, right. It tells us how about how many speakers um, in different areas they come from. But academics actually make up much more than one fifth. I would say almost half is, is academics and serious academics from the LC adds a lot to our, our program as well as the incredible practitioners that you brings. Um, that I think another special thing about the program is that it it is uh, partly vocational but also serious in its academic pursuits as well. Um, with the with the practitioners who are teaching us how to conduct diplomacy and strategy and practice, and that's combined with academics who give us those analytical abilities to explain why and how come practices taking on the trends it is. Um, the students on the program, of course, I think are another important benefit that you have high achieving, outstanding uh, young professionals from a variety of sectors. Each year is always a terrific uh, cohort. It's about 30, 35 students each year. So it is a small group and you get to know each other over the year. Um, Alia and Alistair will tell you more about that. Um, there's a strong track record of of placing uh, these students that move on to, they move up uh, in their careers and some move on to different sectors uh, according to their own plans and aims. Um, like I said, it's a it's a real academic credential. Uh, so it does, does have uh, a lot of uh, academic assignments and rigor behind it, but uh, it's a serious credential from, from a serious institution. Uh, okay, I think that should be enough for me. I'm, I'm really interested to hear everyone's questions.
Dr. Nafi, yeah. Is it any um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Uh, we'll go to Dr. Nick Kitchen now, who's a course tutor on the program. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, I'm Nick Kitchen. I'm a research fellow, uh, visiting fellow at Ideas, and uh, previously of, of LSE these days. I'm an associate professor at the University of Surrey. Um, and I teach on the program uh, for the non-residential students. Um, if you're thinking about the non-residential option, it's me that you'll be spending uh, your time with on a Wednesday evening. So in terms of that option, you attend in person those four intensive weeks and the two policy weekends. But on a Wednesday evening, our regular academic sessions um, which consists of a lecture and a seminar, you'll be joining those online together with myself. Um, and the way that works is we, we zoom into the room for the lecture. Um, so that operates hybrid. You're able to ask questions just like the, uh, the students who are in the room. And then afterwards, when the students go for an in-person seminar with, with Aaron, um, you join myself for uh, an online seminar um, via Zoom. Um, the way we would run that, um, it is quite different kind of pedagogically from being able to be there physically in person. Some of you may be um, in very different time zones. So we've got Australian students on, on the program uh, zooming in um, very early in the morning, um, uh, for example. So we run we run those sessions with a range of different types of uh, discussions, breakout rooms for small group tasks so try and make sure that we get a sense of uh, of community um in that kind of um online space um so you'll see me for those um the other thing that you'll see me for if you're a, a non-residential student um is for dissertation advice so i will be your advisors and, and we'll meet um to work through uh, your dissertation plans, your your research project, your research question, and to talk that through in the preparation for that dissertation plan assignment that Aaron spoke about, and then through the feedback um, from that uh, assignment, uh, taking you then into the summer where you go off independently uh, to do that dissertation. Um, so that's me. I will um, now hand over um, to one of our students, Alistair, I think it's you up. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, great, great to see you. Great to have you here. So look, um, I'll touch on four different areas. My, my Before I get into those four areas, my, my background is 20 years work experience in HSBC, which is a, a large international bank. So I spent half that time working overseas in different countries. Um, and after 20 years, I wanted a break and I wanted to try something new. And I decided to take a sabbatical and join this course to provide some structure to it. And I would just start by saying doing this course is one of the best things I've ever done. So um, it's it's been brilliant. The four areas that I thought I'd touch on and add some colour to are, are number one around this, what it feels like as a student in terms of the substance and the style of the course. So uh, all the speakers have touched on this combination of, of academic and practitioner and, and it's critical to the nature of the course and how you feel as a student because what the the practitioners bring is real world practical ideas and experience to events that you are probably interested in and you want to explore and you get they bring substance and the practical substance to it and you can explore it to them you can explore it with them what the academics bring is that intellectual rigor and the international relations theory that adds substance to the way you think about those events. Instead of you reading a magazine or a newspaper article or studying something, they add an awful lot of rigor to it. So both are really important and the combination is, is excellent. Um, I guess I think I also think about the course in a different way, which is in terms of input and output. So the input being the lectures and the reading, you get a lot of information. The output, which Aaron touched on in terms of the essays, are also a combination of practical and or practitioner and academic led. So two of the essays are quite focused on the academic literature. Two of them are quite focused on the practical side. And then you've got the dissertation, which is separate. But that continues this combination which, which is super powerful um there's a lot of 
uh, during the course, there's a lot of engagement with the other students. So Aliyah and I, you know, talk a lot. And I'll let Aliyah comment on that in a minute. But um, the the face to face events are excellent for getting to know each other, and you become really good friends. Um, and and you do become really good friends because some of the topics are obviously controversial, and you quite often disagree on things. But at the end of it, everyone is there to learn. So you do become great friends. There's about 30 of us on this course. We are a wide mixture of individuals, uh, backgrounds, experiences, work experiences, outlook. A lot of us disagree on some things. So, you know, the, the Palestine-Israel situation is something that a number of us disagree on and has meant that we've got to know each other a lot better and had some really robust discussions, quite often not in the substance of the course, but afterwards. So as a residential student about 50 percent of us roughly a residential 50 percent non-residential uh we often meet he referred to it on a wednesday evening for a drink after the lecture and we'll quite often have some pretty good conversations around it um so i'd say the group of individuals is uh the students that you join is the best bit about the course because there is a massive diversity in the individuals and a lot of us i suspect will be friends for a long time afterwards so then the third thing I just touch on is the organization of the course. And you can see it in, in the people on the, on, the, on the screen right now. But it is organized by a really close knit group of well coordinated, well organized individuals, which means that, you know, I can go to Hugh, for instance, on a bunch of for a bunch of advice on where to find information on a particular practical current affairs issue that I'm interested in that I want to find more advice on right now. Or I could go to Aaron, for instance, to say, Aaron, I really want to explore, explore the academic literature on X, Y, Z. Where can I start? Can you help me out? And I could do the same with Nick. It just happens that Aaron is my, my tutor. So um, it, is, it, is, it is really well run and you can explore a lot of things that you are interested in. So my fourth and final point is, it is a serious commitment. It is an exec MSc, but it is a serious commitment. So you've got to think about whether you've got the time and the commitment throughout the year to take it. Um, I, I, it, it has been brilliant for me, and I would recognise Aaron's points around, you know, what do people, what do students do with it? I think if I think about us as a group, most of us are either trying to upskill in our current careers or transition into a new career. I was trying to do the second one. Actually, through the year, I probably decided I'm not going to use this course to transition and I've done it for fun, which is almost the most the best way, because then you for me personally, because then you can get a lot out of it that you find really interesting. Um, so I have absolutely loved it. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, let me stop there and I'll hand over to Aaliyah. Thank you, Alistair. And uh, it's really nice to see you again. And I look forward to see you and the uh, the rest of the team, inshallah, on uh, uh, our intensive week in uh, April, this month, actually. So uh, I would start by uh, greeting everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Asad. I am uh, based on Saudi Arabia. And uh, I work in a consultation uh, field uh, in the impact investment sector. And this sector actually, uh, it's a hybrid between the nonprofit and the private sector. So um, uh, I work in a holding company that incubate around 12 subsidiaries in different social issues uh, that works in different social issues, I would say. So the program is seriously new topic for me, uh, but it was a really interesting journey and I look forward to the, um, I would say the upcoming uh, achievements and uh, challenges. So uh, I would just uh, uh, like put my experience into two points. Interestingly, both points are related to elephants somehow. So I don't know why, but it, it, it does. <laughs> So uh, first of all, I would want to cover um, uh, why I joined this program. And I got inspired by, I really always get inspired by the elephant in the circus story, where they get a small elephant chained into a metal uh, chain, and they make them believe that they can't go out of this metal chain. Though they grow up and uh, like um, become stronger, they still believe that they're still in that metal chain and they still can't break up themselves free. So I think we are human, all, always uh, face this issue. Uh, 
So uh, uh, what I find that really um, um, a good tool to break you free from out of this kind of environment is to take such a program where you really change your, the environment. You meet really different people from different backgrounds um, and put yourself in a really big challenges that you think you can't make. But with the time, with the process, you find yourself um, get over them and um, uh, let's say achieve them. Uh, and it's it's really important to tie this into your uh, career. Uh, so I thought uh, taking this program is really uh, connected to, uh, I would say, uh, thinking strategically, working in the field of ecosystem strategy. It is in different sector, but I think the mindset, the skills that you use as negoti negotiation and uh, understanding comp complexity, actually, it's um, uh, it's could be applied in different uh, levels and in different aspects and field. So, um, covering my second point, which is related to elephant as well. So uh, is how uh, I see this journey unfolded. So there is a saying said that uh, how to eat an elephant and the reply comes as one bite at a time. And I, during this program, uh, I really um, I think the process, we need to trust the process. So it, it looks so overwhelming in every sessions and along the way, but um, trusting the process of the journey, trusting that the weekly sessions that you attend, the discussions that you attend, the small like talk you, you have with the professors or the student, it was really effective. And at the, in the middle of the journey, I said, oh, I really starting to get familiar with things that I so I thought that it's impossible to, I need a lot of time to, to, to come over. So really trusting the process was a really uh, good thing. Also the serious commitment, as Alistair said. So yes, it's it's needs a serious uh, of uh, serious commitment and um, maybe balancing this with, with a really busy consulting uh, of, uh, work. It's it's uh it sounds undoable, but uh doing it uh, really in a consistent matter and small uh, bits uh, would uh, like uh, help us achieve this uh, um, program. I would conclude uh, with uh, three points that I really appreciate. It's not related to elephant anymore. So uh, these three points that I really appreciate is the uh, in the program is the simulation sessions. So. Uh, uh, the simulation sessions was a really uh, wonderful experience. I I really, uh, it's a vast um, opportunity of learning from every aspect. You you deepen your understanding of the topic. You um, test your skills and potentials into certain areas, and uh, you uh, I would say um, see the topics from different perspective and different kind of kind of view. So these simulation sessions were really wonderful um, um, experience. The second thing is the discussions. The discussion they often offer fresh perspective and different and variety of perspective on the topics that we took in the lecture. Um, this would this most of the time deepening in uh, uh, our understanding and most of the time uh, it gives me aha moments where I now understand the topics, putting it into a different perspective, especially uh, appreciating that we have um, a really varieties of backgrounds and nationalities. Um, uh, that was an added value in the discussions as well. And the last uh, point I, I really appreciate is the networking opportunities. So um, talking of uh, as um, an introvert person, uh, the the vast amount of uh, networking opportunity was hilarious. It's really comforting. It's you uh, you have some opportunity during the session. You travel together, so you got that opportunity. You we stayed the whole uh, two whole days in uh, in Cambridge. That was a great opportunity. Also, the uh, the dinner times, uh, having uh, some dinners, not only with the student, but also with the professors, that was a uh, really added value, and I really appreciate it. Um, and finally, I want to conclude. Thank you all for um, uh, your time, and I'm um, open for any questions.
Uh, thank you, Alia and Alistair, for your glowing testimonials. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am Sanya Kulkarni. I am the program manager. And I'll be talking you through some of the logistical aspects of the program, both before and during the year. Um, so I'll be covering things like, uh, you know, the uh, applications, your mode of participation, uh, fees, and so on. Um, so to start off with the modes of participation, we offer two streams. So that's the residential and non-residential streams. And uh, now that we have an overall idea of what the year looks like, we can divide it broadly into three blocks. So that's your term time teaching that takes place during your Wednesday evening sessions. Um, and then you have the two policy weekends and four intensive weeks during the entire year. Now, the real difference between the two streams um, is your attendance um, for the Wednesday sessions. So if you're a residential student, you will be based in London for the entirety of the program. And all of your teaching, you will be attending in person on LSE campus. Um, whereas if you're non-residential, you'll be joining the Wednesday sessions online. And Nick has already um, touched upon this and how it's done. Um, we have hybrid facilities. So your lecture will be in the same room as the non uh, as the residential students. And then you go away for your two separate seminar groups. Um, and now depending on where you're based, where you're working, uh, there will be visa implications. Um, and LSE does sponsor student visas. So once you've applied, please make sure to look into what visa you may require. Uh, we have a dedicated team at LSC to help you through any questions you may have. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the link on the screen, but if you just Google LSC visa advice team, you'll be able to find ways of contacting them with any queries you may have. Um, so moving on to applications, they are currently open for the academic year 2024-25 which begins in September, 2024. Um, and applications will be open until the end of August, but we would urge you to submit it at the earliest because it is a competitive program and um, there are requirements that you need to fulfill, some of which have been highlighted on the screen. Um, that being said, on our website, on the LSE Ideas Executive MSc webpage, we have a dedicated tab um, that outlines your know, entry requirements and guidance on how to apply. Um, so you have some of the main points on the screen here, but there may be other details like an English language test, et cetera, that you may have to take. Um, so please feel free to have a look at our website and um, see what may apply. Um, and moving on to the next slide, please. This is a, an overview of the calendar for when both streams of students, so residential and non-residential students, will be attending teaching together. So these are the four intensive weeks for next year, as well as the policy weekends. Um, and otherwise you have the Wednesday seminars that you can look at our academic calendar, uh, which is available on our website. Um, and in our brochure. Um, and moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, this is, again, an, a very broad overview of the fees. Um, so fees for next academic year are 32,846 British pounds, 10% uh, of which you will be paying to secure your place once you have completed your application and received an offer. Um, following which, once you begin your studies, uh, there's two options for you to pay. So one is you pay all of it together at the either at the start, or usually at the start of the program, um, or in three installments, which have also been outlined on the screen here. Uh, now, if you are a sponsored student, either by your own organization or by an external scholarship, um, there is a financial undertaking form that you will have to fill out and submit um, at the end of your application. Um, again, any questions that you may have about this, 
feel free to ask them to us right now, or there's also an email address on the screen. That's fees at lsc.ac.uk that may be able to answer any detailed questions that you have. Um, and speaking of contacts, on the next slide, we have outlined all of the contacts that are relevant to you starting your application. So we have the Graduate Admissions Office, which is the main department at the LSE that processes all applications. Uh, then we have fees, we have visa advice, and then we have three contacts that are already here. So we have Aaron, myself, and Yu Song, who will be able to answer any other questions that you may have outside of this session as well. Um, so I think I've covered the bare bones of everything, but if there's a point that you want me to elaborate on, please feel free to send a question. Um, and I think we can open for Q&A now. Um, so thank you so much. Okay. We um, already have a few questions. So the first one is, um, do residentials see more weekly sessions or only Wednesday ones? Um, and by the same person, is the visa issued for the whole course duration or it needs to be? So it is uh, issued for the entire year. So your, the entirety of your studies at LSE will be sponsored. Um, so you don't have to reapply. Um, so there's no difference in the number of Wednesday sessions that you have access to. All students have the same number of Wednesday sessions. It's just that you're either attending in person or online. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, there's another one for me, from Peter. Um, that's regarding the first policy weekend. Uh, you said that there was a consideration to move it one week earlier to 26, 27. Um, the dates are something that we're still working on. So the final calendar will be available on the website. Um, Aaron, if you wanted to jump in on this, this is about the first policy weekend that was... Um, um, yeah, we reserve yeah. the right to move dates around if necessary, but we really try not to, and we really try to keep it fixed once they are fixed. Um, that That's the way we, we organize it. The first policy weekend is usually around those, those times each year. It won't dramatically change, uh, maybe one week or the other, um, but it, it's not quite confirmed yet. It depends on rooms and another demands. Um, there's another one from Peter that's uh, about if, so if he joins the non-residential program and if he's in London during some of the weeks, can he join some of the seminars in person? And that's uh, up to Nick and Aaron, so I'll leave it to them. Uh, yeah, the usual policy is usually yes, um, depending on demand, right? So there are different streams and students are uh, really um, meant to switch streams at, at will. Um, but if a, a student happens to be in town, that usually is a nice thing actually to join us in person. Uh, the, the danger is when students are uh, residential and they join online quite often, that can create uh, problems for the numbers of students in the online seminar. So the quality of the education could become diluted for non-residential students. So the rule there is that you have to check with the seminar leader first, either Nick or myself, but usually under most circumstances, it's okay. Can I jump in and ask, actually ask uh, Alistair and Alia if you had any thoughts on any of the questions that, that uh, the prospective students uh, just raised? Um. I, I guess I was just thinking as you were, uh, were asking for, you know, uh, do residential students have more um, opportunities to get together? I, uh, that's organized by the course. I mean, I, the, the answer that was given was absolutely right from my perspective. I guess you do, you know, a few of us, if there's like, uh, if there's an essay topic that we're struggling a little with, Leah mentioned, you know, parts of the course can seem daunting and um 
and and she talked about that importance of going through the process of the course which i completely agree with her on you do as you go through the course realize that your own learning increases but nevertheless there are moments when you think oh my word how am i going to handle this one and so a few of us do get together face to face to discuss we've probably done it three or four times to discuss a difficult question or an interesting lecture or a hot topical issue um usually and we also get together on Wednesday evenings after the Wednesday lecture. That is a that happens pretty much every week. Um, but I think, Aliyah, you probably do that as non-residential students as well. Is that fair? Uh, so, yeah, I think what uh, as a non-residential student, uh, what I miss out actually the, uh, you know, the this informal meetings. Uh, that happens, you know, in between. But I think the weekly sessions would cover a lot and the WhatsApp groups and sometimes the informal, you know, communication with the team, it gives you some support, you know, uh, uh, because we usually meet virtually um, face uh, to face is much better. We cover this during the intensive week and the policy weekends and we cover most of them during the weekly sessions, maybe in the discussions uh, hour. It's a good timing to communicate and the, um, I would say the WhatsApp group for, you know, general support, sharing some concerns, some questions to debates. This is, I, I find it really important as well. Yeah, so I, I we, we have a very lively WhatsApp group, for instance, <laughs> to draw on Aaliyah's comment. And um, one of the essays was on, uh, it, it, it was was on Russia uh, and Ukraine, and you could take a different view of how it would how you'd approach it. I decided to write it on Russia. I found it very difficult to find information uh, that was written in English on Russian foreign policy in Ukraine. And I asked the group, and there's a couple of people in the group who are very experienced, and one of them covers Russia in terms of his role. Uh, in in a government and he was able to share some really good stuff on that whatsapp group which other people i know also used as well so it's don't i wouldn't worry about whether residential or non-residential gets more exposure it in terms of how the course is organized you don't both groups whatever you you get to know each other so well in those four weeks and those two weekends you just become friends you, we don't really think of each other as is residential or non-residential that's the, i guess that's the key point yeah i totally agree i think that also i would add up to that point is uh, the opportunity of non-residential is uh, you don't miss out on your uh, you know job your life it's now it's becoming like doable uh, that's what makes it doable otherwise uh, most of the team uh, or the, the people who joined can't make it because of their commitments and their careers and um um, their responsibilities, you know. Uh, that actually ties into another question that we've received, which is what percentage of students pursuing this um, are working full time? Um, that's a majority of our students, but the two that we have now, um, Alistair and Alia. Alistair has, is on sabbatical, if I'm not wrong, and Alia is working full time. Um, so is that something you want to touch on and how you're managing your job while doing the program. Aliyah, do you want to go first? Because you're the one that's working. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think I've touched on that point. Uh, I think um, uh, like uh, consistency on the um, things, the timing that you give to the course, it's a it's a really serious one. I, I And there is no like a limit. You always can do better. There is always uh, some uh, space to, um, to um, like explore and advance. Um, I would advise that you connect it somehow to your field. I, I can can I want to connect it the thesis with something I'm uh, related to my work. This would facilitate a lot, lot of things. Uh, but uh, however, uh, I think it's manageable, and uh, it is an interesting and challenging journey. Act after all, yeah. I, I so I'd pick on something that Elia said, which was um. The structure of the course enables you to devote within reason as much time to it as you want. So there'll be some weeks I'll devote two or three days to it because I have that flexibility. And there'll be some days when I won't because I have other things going on. Um, uh, so it, it, it is a very good course for you as a working 
leader exec whatever to be able to flex it around your timetable and the timetable as you can see is uh, largely stable the time work is stable a long time in advance so you can plan your diary and your commitment i think you can flex it to your own personal uh, demands um thank you uh, we have another question from Peter who asks, could you please describe an ideal candidate profile that you are looking for for the program? Um, is there anyone that wants to take that? that so, well, let, well, let, let me just say one thing and then hand it over to my colleagues. And um, I think one of them is uh, you, you have two examples in front of you of, of our, our current students as, as kind of ideal and, and in, in the sense that they have, you can, what I hear and what they're saying is they're, they have the commitment, they're enthusiastic about the issues, they bring expertise from, from their background, which helps animate what's going on, they produce, they, they seek, seek out other candidates, other ideas, they engage with the, with the academics, they engage with the policymakers, and the, the total of that is to produce a really exciting, dynamic, and very uh, in-touch kind of uh, program. So that's a, that's a very sum, summary sort of way, and I, I, I hand it to, to, uh, to, to my colleagues, uh, uh, Hugh, Aaron, Nick, uh, for, for their comments. Yeah, I agree with that. There isn't an ideal candidate because uh, the people who come on the course are so tremendously different. I would put it the other way around and say, what are the minimum requirements? And those are simply curiosity, energy, uh, some interesting experience, um, and, a, and a desire to really grip and understand what's going on in the world today and to find a new way of looking at it. Um, and also to invest. This is a big investment. Uh, and I don't mean that money-wise. I mean, it's a big investment intellectually uh, in, in a sense, re-equipping or, or, or um, uh, overhauling some of your preconceptions, your assumptions, your knowledge, and bringing it into a kind of new era. So there's kind of a minimum stuff that you need. And I would guess that pretty much everybody on this call today has got that. And that's what you need to focus on. If you've got that, you're you're the ideal candidate. I just uh, pick up on that, Hugh, from the the non-residential uh, point of view. Having having taught on this program now for uh, over a decade, the the most important thing is that you really want to take the program. That sense of enthusiasm and the you know the commitment to it and the energy that you're going to bring to it, and it's. It's even more important, I would say, to bring that when you're a non-residential student, um, because there is an element of doing things online that is not as natural, not as easy as uh, as doing things in person, right? We all know that, we've all experienced that. Um, so to come to an online seminar and to make that work not only for you, but for your colleagues and uh, and to make that whole kind of learning arrangement work well, we need people who are going to be kind of really committed, really enthusiastic. They want to talk. They, you know, they've, they've done their work beforehand. They've got interesting questions to ask. So that kind of sense of curiosity is is the thing that I would be really looking for in the, in the students we're after. If I could just add something to it from a student's perspective. So um, one thing we haven't really, I'm not sure what was clear to me before I joined the course, and I'm not sure we really made it clear today. So these Wednesday lectures, which is the most frequent uh, way that you learn in terms of that input I talked about, what it is, is two hours. And an hour is a lecture, which is which is a majority of time someone giving a lecture, but also a substantial amount of time for you to ask questions. And then it's another hour of discussion, which is a seminar where students discuss two or three uh, questions that the people on this call put to us and we discuss it with each other. So you genuinely spend a lot of time learning from each other. And of course, the longer you're on the course, the more you learn from each other. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is there is a, is a big opportunity for you you don't underestimate how much you can bring to that second hour discussion every time, no matter your background. I don't have a politics background. 
I've always been interested in foreign policy and international current affairs, but I, my experience is living in a lot of different countries and helping a lot of businesses tackle international issues. Other people have very different backgrounds and issues, and everyone has brought something to all of those conversations. So don't underestimate, as long as you've got that kind of international curiosity and that international experience, don't underestimate how much you can bring to the course. Um, thank you. Um, we have one question that's, what normally is the London time for the Wednesday classes? So that's um, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. London time is the lecture. And the seminars are 7 to 8 p.m. Um, that answers two questions, actually. Uh, and then we have another one that, okay, how does the dissertation process work for non-residential students? So, um, Nick, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I think it's important to note that this is the same process for non-residential students as it is for residential students. Um, so dissertation, dissertation supervision uh, initially starts with uh, a, a, an, an all group kind of uh, seminar where Aaron and I take you through what a dissertation is um, and, and how to think about building a research project. So there's some kind of research training uh, happens initially there. Then in terms of thinking about your individual project, um, you can have conversations with either myself or Aaron throughout the course of the year. Um, but it starts kind of for proper with a, an individual meeting with Chris as the course director, um, where you can kind of throw some ideas out and, and, and discuss them. Um, following that meeting, you'll have a meeting um, with myself or Aaron. So if you're a residential student, Aaron will be your dissertation supervisor. If you're non-residential, it will be me. And obviously those meetings um, for the non-residential students, those are held online um, at your convenience, essentially, or mutual convenience. Um, and we'll have a discussion about how, um, how to formulate that project in more specific detail. So thinking through your research question, the theoretical framework that you're going to use to answer this question, um, the methods that you might employ here. Normally, um, that single meeting may be enough for you to go ahead and deliver your dissertation plan. Sometimes there may be a, a, a second meeting. Um, and then you deliver the dissertation plan, which is essentially a blueprint for your dissertation. And you get then uh, that plan is marked, you get feedback on that plan, and then there's the opportunity to discuss again um, your your project in, you know, in kind of going through that feedback, understanding what you might need to change um, or what could be improved before you then go off for the summer and you conduct your research independently so there is a hard cutoff date for supervision because we do want this and the lse requires this of all dissertations that these should be independent research projects but that planning time the support you get through the planning time is really really important and it's the same for non-residential as residential it's just that the non-residential students will be having those meetings um, online and the residential students will for the most part be having them in person Um, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat right now, um, but I do want to draw your attention to our FAQs tab, which is also on our website, which in case there's anything else that you might want to, that you may have forgotten to ask right now, um, we have a wealth of questions online that are already answered. Um, if not, we're also available to answer your queries um, via email. We also have consultations with members of the team that you can book via our website um, and we can set up a meeting and talk about your application and anything else that you may want to talk about. Um, so if there's no more questions, we can move on to um, conclude this session. I'll hand over to Chris for this. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks everybody who today who's uh, joined us. Um, we've given you uh, a, a good uh, summary of, of our program, the, the particulars, the dynamics there. We're, we're most uh, especially appreciative of, of our current students who've shared some of their time and insights. So we, we uh, and what I think that, that you might want to take away from this is the kind of enthusiasm that they have, which we share, as uh, as uh, working on a as to working on a common project, uh, unpacking international strategy, uh, the, the the world of diplomacy, uh, negotiations, and the like, in the context of a very uh, fast changing, evolving international system. Yesterday isn't the same as as as, as tomorrow, and and we provide some of the insights into what and the tools to to make sense of those transitions, that change, and the dynamics, be they in the finance sector, be it in diplomacy, NGO, you name it. So we're 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 enthusiastic to welcome you to our program. Do stay in touch, and we look forward to seeing some of you, if not all of you, uh, in the coming year. Thank you very much.